For all Verdi's life, he was a composer for theatre. By the 1870s, he'd written several smash hits for Italian opera, including Rigoletto, which focuses on a hunchbacked court jester, Aida, the ancient Egyptian love story about an Ethiopian princess and an Egyptian commander, and La Traviata, which is about a call girl who's dying from the clap. So at that time, for him to produce anything ecclesiastical would have been absurd or even a joke. The golden age of Italian church music, which culminated in the great works of Giovanni Palestrina, was 300 years ago, a distant memory and never more absent from European musical consciousness than in the late 1800s. Moreover, many were beginning to find Italian music a bit stale. In other countries, especially Germany, music composition and opera were making all kinds of groundbreaking advances. But in Italy, even the Italian music critic Abramo Basevi said that Italian opera hasn't really made any progress since Rossini's William Tell in 1832. Sure, Italy had some of the world's greatest voices, but there was only so much of this kind of music, with its flourishing singing and sloppy orchestration, that people could tolerate. And this style of music certainly wasn't suitable for religious affairs. So, with his background in theatre and the decaying state of Italian music, it would have seemed almost laughable or even shocking that Verdi, of all people, would attempt to set the Catholic mass for the dead to his theatrical style of music. How could he, a theatre composer, possibly write with the deference, respect and solemnity required of Catholic music? But in 1873, something changed. Verdi's friend, the poet Manzoni, died. Verdi had immense respect for Manzoni, calling him the last great Italian after Rossini. And while Verdi at the time had announced his retirement from composing operas, something about Manzoni's death at this point in Verdi's life inspired him to write this immense requiem in memory of his friend. And despite the naysayers of Italian music, Verdi rises to the challenge on his own terms, in a unique and original way. The Requiem is in his theatrical Italian operatic style, and yet it is as utterly sincere as any religious music. He doesn't attempt to mimic other religious or German styles. Instead, Verdi takes the skills he has honed for his entire life from Italian opera and uses them to mould a grand work of flaming sincerity. Whereas Mozart's Requiem moves us primarily with its structural ingenuity and beauty, and Berlioz moves us with his sheer force, Verdi moves us with his expert understanding of drama and melodrama, his expressions of trepidation and complete unrepressed human grief. How very Italian. And this is his forte. He's playing to his strength, taking pure Italian opera with its appeal to the emotions and moulding it with the serious solemnity of a great mass for the dead so that both religious respect and the heaviness of human emotion come through with full force. And in doing so, he produces what Brahms called a work of genius and what many ironically call Verdi's greatest opera. So let's run through the music, and this music is best looked at alongside the Requiem text that it's set to. The very beginning starts with this sincere, mournful quality. It sets up a mood of grief and emptiness with the choir singing in monotone. But then, light, a change to the major, and such a beautiful change as they sing for everlasting light. And then there's a startling change to a prayer, imitated across the different voices, which cries out with some urgency, and then becomes intimate, whispered, and then more urgent and pleading again. Somehow this section manages to be both urgent and yet intimate and peaceful. The Requiem and Everlasting Light sections are repeated, but this time it builds to a serious climax. And then the Kyrie. Each solo voice is magnificently introduced in turn. First the tenor, then bass, soprano and finally mezzo-soprano to this new theme. And now we have the magnificence of opera. And this theme keeps coming back in imitation. Creating all kinds of glorious musical effects, mini climaxes, 
and moments of beauty or drama. Until a surprising and humbling ending. Part 2 begins with the DS Irae. It's apocalyptic terror. Nothing like this had ever been done before, let alone at a Catholic Mass for the Dead. It famously uses this massive bass drum. Just like a hammer of judgement. And this winds down as they sing, What trembling shall there be? With whispered, malicious intensity. This is followed by the tuba mirum. The trumpet shall sound and raise all from the dead. And Verdi here places trumpets off stage or at the other end of the building to create an effect of vast space. Slowly, these ominous fanfares build up a dark chord of tension until the mighty power of the orchestra and chorus comes to full force as if raising the dead. Then the music rises to triumph. Drama of epic proportions, and what a climax. The more stupebit follows. Death and nature shall be astounded. This is almost filmic. An understated level of tension is built, with low strings and a bass solo. This is great Italian operatic drama, brought to religious ritual. Listen to how the music sinks, punctuated by powerful silence and the word death. Then, the Liber Scriptus. This is an emotional telling of how the world will be judged. It's almost a plea of desperation. Again, it's high Italian melodrama. And throughout this, the chorus interjects with quiet whispers of... The day of wrath is coming. Verdi also pulls off the same trick as more stupebit, this time with the word nil, meaning none or no one. And then, something is stewing. We can sense it. We can feel our blood boiling. The music becomes supercharged. And suddenly we hear a repeat of some of the Dies Irae. A constant reminder that the Day of Judgment is coming. You can see that this is no respectful retelling of the scripture, but a high dramatic warning. Then, the quid so misa. What shall I say in my misery? The initial bassoon riff is kind of jazzy. But the trio of solo voices give it a tragic atmosphere with musical sighs. And then we're surprised by the Rex Tremende, King of Awful Majesty, which is given this theme. But it has this peaceful echo as they sing, Who freely saveth the redeemed. And then this wonderful melody to the words is imitated around the solo voices. They sing Save Me, O Fount of Mercy, as the music keeps changing key with lovely polyphony. the awful majesty wins, with full dramatic intensity building to a huge climax. And then it's almost like this aftershock, this quiet, awestruck, pious reaction to what's just happened. Which leads into a second wonderful climax on the words, Save me, O Fount of Mercy. Then we get the recordare. These wind figures recall the salvame cries of the previous movement. 
The Record Diary is totally operatic in style. As a duet, it can be lifted straight from a tragic opera. This is followed by the Ingemisco, probably the most full-blooded Italian part of the piece, perfect for Pavarotti. It starts with recitative. He recites, I groan as one guilty, spare me, O God. It's all dramatic recitation. The music is following the text. And then after the recit comes the aria with this theme. Beautiful, melodious, intensely Italian. And how the drama continues as he sings, My prayers are not worthy. Pure theater. But there's a second melody in this movement with high tremolo strings. This one's more beautiful and peaceful as he imagines being placed above on high. Then the Confutatis. Again, Verdi's theatre takes over. Listen to how the damned are thrown into sharp flames. Normally when composers set this text, they focus on the contrast between the first two lines and the last line. But Verdi's dramatic sense compels him to speed through this stanza quickly and focus on the prayer that follows it. Why? Surely flames and hellfire are more dramatic, but Verdi wants to focus on the human element, on squeezing human drama out of these texts, so he makes this prayer a repentant, sorrowful appeal. And in one of the great moments, he's definitely going to resolve into E minor, isn't he? He surprises us with G minor, and then a complete recurrence of the Dies Irae. The day of wrath is always present. Then finally, the Lacrimosa, one of the greatest melodies in the whole Requiem. This works as a kind of theme in variations. We hear it softly in the major. And then it builds with heavy, heavy melodramatic grieving. to one of my favorite climaxes. And then the calm after the storm. There are more variations on this melody, but ultimately the mood calms until the Amen at the end of the second part of the Requiem. And this Amen is like a surging of the spirit. Before we're brought to rest. Part three of the Requiem, the Offertorio. After all that drama, we get a solo quartet focusing on this theme. The whole movement expresses calm and faith, despite the terrors of the words they are singing. And the soprano's entrance is hair-raisingly sublime, one of the great moments of the piece. The Hostias gives us a new melody from the tenor. Part 4, the Sanctus. 
A vivid contrast to the rest of the work, this starts with a massive fanfare. And then the voice is split into two choirs and sings an unbroken double fugue on these two subjects. There's a middle section with this glowing sheen to it. But the orchestra keeps dancing. It all seems to fade away, but then suddenly the music blazes out again and comes to a brilliant end. Part 5, The Agnus Dei. And what a contrast to the Sanctus. There's a very touching melody. which is then given several variations, first from the chorus unharmonized, then harmonized in the minor, then fully harmonized in the major, then lovely with three flutes surrounding two voices in this flow of counterpoint. And then again with chorus in a new harmonization with strings. Passion straight from the heart. And finally it ends with a short coda. Part 6, the Lux Eterna, creates a new mysterious mood. A soft high tremolo which keeps changing key mysteriously as the mezzo-soprano sings for everlasting light. Then the bass takes the Requiem Eternum over a dark B-flat minor. Then the trio of voices deals with the rest of the text. But the dark B-flat minor comes back with the bass, but now with the other voices helping too. So there's this contrast between the eternal light and the black darkness of death. And in the middle of the movement, we get this exquisitely scored new melody. The movement finally settles on this lyric melody and ends in a sublime colour, a kind of unifying of darkness and light, where high and low come together. And finally, part seven, the Liberame. And it would seem that everything has been leading up to this point. Some of the themes we've already heard return in this final part. What's interesting about this is that it was actually composed in 1869, five years before the rest of the work, for the death of the great opera composer Rossini. This means that Verdi knew what was coming musically, and yet, being a brilliant composer, he managed to structure the previous movements so that everything leads up to this point. It begins with a melodramatic soprano declamation. Then the words, when thou shalt come to judge, get more dramatic, intense, fire is coming. But the drama settles. The orchestra is seasick as the soprano trembles with operatic fear. But this is just the dramatic introduction. Then, out of nowhere, the DS Ire returns, but this time with different text. And saving the best until now, he adds even more drama than any time before. This shows that Verdi could hold in reserve what had already been written, so that it only comes right at the end, even though he knew what was coming and could have done the same earlier. But the most moving and stunning architectural stroke in the whole work is the return of the Requiem Eternum from the very beginning. 
Now, instead of strings and monotone choir, it's given to a cappella chorus and solo soprano, and it's a sublime moment for the soloist. There are moments which are almost awestruck. And the end of the passage induces spine shivers. But suddenly, drama from the depths of hell. And then a fugue on the liberame to end the work. This fugue is both dramatic and a stunning example of counterpoint. There are inversions, and the subject is augmented or made longer. And then it's treated in stretto or very fast imitations. It goes in all kinds of dramatic directions with the soprano singing with incredible emotion and lyrical lines throughout. And then a fiery build-up leads to a huge climax. And these evil spirits simmer back down to their home. There's a return of the soprano declamation, now a little more calm. And then finally a peaceful, reverent ending which is perfect in its poetry and solemnity. I hope you enjoyed this guide. Please do subscribe if you want to see more like this, all kinds of classical music, film music, choral music, and guides to music. And let me know in the comments what you might like to see next. Thanks for watching.